Hello, everybody. Thank you, Dima, for the introduction. So I, I just uh, maybe wanted to start by recalling you um, the uh, this global picture for our mini course and uh, recalling where, where we are. So um, yesterday uh, we looked a little bit at uh, intersections of planar curves and of self intersections, and we introduced uh, two structures related to it: the Goldman bracket and the Turev co bracket. And today we want to do a little bit of geometry with the moduli of uh, flat connections. Uh, well, of course, it's not quite a coincidence that Nikolai also uh, spoke about moduli of flat connections. So there will be considerable overlaps, but I think we should still do our work. Maybe we repeat some things, but some things surely will be a little bit different from his presentation. So um, at some point, tell me if it gets uh, too boring or too repetitive, we can always accelerate. All right, so um, let me try to go to the end of the, um, of the notes and create one more page. So, um, so modulin of flat connections. Um, and uh, maybe I recall the context. Uh, so we have sigma, which is a compact connected oriented to manifold. So we always draw it. Well, that's basically the only drawing that I'm able to do. Um, uh, it has a genus G and um, the number of uh, boundary components is n plus one, but sometimes rarely I can say it's also zero. So we also consider closed surfaces from time to time. Now the second ingredient is G. Um, connected and often simply connected, but I mean, for many things it's not needed, but sometimes it's more convenient. Li group. So uh, to, to these two elements of data, to sigma and g, uh, we can associate what sometimes people call Betty moduli space. So this is M of sigma G. And uh, this is the space of homomorphisms from uh, the fundamental group of the surface that we denote simply by pi uh, to the group G divided by the action of G. And um, so if we have a homomorphism, which we denote maybe by rho hat, then this action is given by, so rho hat uh, of say gamma uh, is mapped to the map rho hat G of gamma, which is simply a conjugate of the homomorphism rho hat. So these are um, these are uh, isomorphism classes of homomorphisms from pi to g modular conjugations on the target. Now um, I uh, actually this is uh, this this is not a very good definition of the space M because uh, the space if I really define it like that it will have very severe or it, at least in many cases it will have very severe singularities. So in fact, typically people consider not all the points from home pi of home pi g before they divide. So then it depends a little bit. You, you need to negotiate, depends on the group g that you're using. However, I uh, learned from uh, Nikolai's mini course that uh, one should blame Ezra Getzler. 
and uh, say that we don't care about <laughs> such things. So if it's okay for you, we, we, we don't, uh, I, I, I'm not gonna discuss uh, this very important question, right? So the uh, real definition, um, the real definition uh, uses uh, more sophisticated quotient uh, techniques. So, um, right, so this is one definition of the moduli space. Maybe one remark on that. Suppose that um, the boundary is non-empty. So the boundary of sigma is non-empty. So then uh, uh, we know that pi is a free group, right? Pi is isomorphic to the free group or Frank to G plus N. And uh, this also means that actually at least the space of homomorphisms on pi G is simply isomorphic to G to the power two G plus N. Of course, there are many ways to, uh, to choose this homomorphism, uh, but at least that space is really easier. Uh, and after that, you divide it by the action of G. Well, I mean, of course, you may have, uh, it, it's not only orbifold singularities, there might be some, uh, some, some worse singularities which may arise, but um, well, then uh, one needs to negotiate of what one wants. All right, so now there is another definition that will also be useful for us sometimes it is mm, referred to as the Durham moduli space. So I think that's, uh, that's the space that uh, Nikolai was defining. So M, um, oof, sorry, I have this color code that, so M sigma G, is equal to the space of um, um, connections, that is one forms with values in the Lie algebra. To simplify things, I will assume that the corresponding G bundle is trivial. For instance, is if G is simply connected, then it's always trivial. And uh, so, um, um, and there is a condition that, uh, the curvature, which is given by this formula, is zero. And we divide, and here I try to align this Nikolai's notation. It is divided by uh, the action of gauge transformations. And I write them pretending that I have a matrix, I have a matrix group. Right. So otherwise the notation becomes too heavy and G is a map from Sigma to the group. Um, under reasonable assumptions, those two spaces um, are the same. One picture is an infinite dimensional picture and Nikolai referred to like some difficulties or at least one, one needs to think how to make sense of this definition, the finite dimensional Betty picture is more straightforward. There you just take a quotient of some uh, uh, manifold product of some number of copies of the group by the simultaneous um, conjugation. Right. So um, one more point to fix. So let's... Uh, Let's fix an invariant element in the second symmetric power of G. Um, for instance, just to, to make it less abstract, in examples, what it is, suppose that uh, mm, G is semi-simple. So then uh, it carries the killing form. Um, and the killing form 
is an element in S2 G star G. So that's uh, that's uh, uh, that's a function with quadratic uh, or whatever bilinear function uh, on G. So an element of uh, S2 G star, and then we can uh, we can put C equal to the sort of inverse of the killing form, or more precisely, a canonical, canonical element where EA upper index and EA lower index are a pair of dual bases under the killing form. So this is a canonical element. So this, this is one standard example, but otherwise you can choose any uh, invariant element in particular you can choose zero this is not a very glorious example but i mean in principle you can do that so here is the serum which we already saw today uh, so that's the serum of a t in bot uh, and it says that m sigma g is Poisson. And um, the corresponding Poisson structure, let me call it pi t. Sorry, but you have a question in chat. Um, whether k is a definite negative. Uh, no, because uh, that's, um, that's if you have a compact compactly algebra, right? But you here, we, I mean, we, we don't care that much. I just want it to be non-degenerate. So that's, um, that's the answer to that question. Um, uh, so, right, pi t uh, is defined by uh, two things, the orientation, of sigma and um, by this element T. So um, like, again, what, what we've seen already, uh, if two conditions hold true, um, if there is no boundary and T is not degenerate. So then actually by T is not degenerate. And the modular space is symplectic. Um, of course, um, all, all these words, they should be a little bit negotiated uh, modular singularities, right? So the space M sigma G might and will probably be singular. So then one should, one should uh, make sense of those words. What does it mean Poisson? What does it mean symplectic and so on? Um, as I said in the first approximation, let's uh, let's simply not care about it for a moment. So here, the definitions are a little bit shaky. Now, the Atiyabot theorem. I don't plan to tell you about uh, the proof. Uh, it was mentioned briefly in Nikolai's lecture. Instead, I will give you an indirect uh, characterization of pi t in some very important particular case. So that's, um, that's the plan. Um, right. So before doing that, mm, let me talk about some distinguished functions on the uh, moduli space. Uh, again, here, mm, it overlaps with the previous mini course, but maybe it's, it's even good. So golden functions. So what are um, what are Goldman functions? 
Um, so let's draw a surface again. Oops, what happened? Right. So here is a surface. Uh, somewhere here, there is a base point, and we choose a curve. So gamma is a curve. And we can choose some lift of gamma to, to the fundamental group. So um, this means I attach it. I choose an attachment to the base point. Um, so similarly, I choose a row, a point of the moduli space. And uh, I choose its lift to home pi g. Now, um, one can either make an assumption that G is a matrix group, or I think I will simply uh, go into the, uh, um, so I will simply go into the example where G is G L and K. For a moment, it doesn't matter so much what is K, but later on in this talk, K will be C. Um, so the Lie algebra is uh, simply matrices. Maybe let me say rank will be capital N. Um, and I need to tell you what is T. Instead, I tell you what is T minus one. So T is not degenerate. There is, um, there is the inverse uh, uh, scalar product on G and I will simply put it equal to the trace of x y. Um, so this is um, this is my example. Well, um, now uh, I define a function f gamma of rho. So gamma is a parameter of the function. Rho is a point of the moduli space. Now I should just say what is the value, and the value is the trace of rho hat of gamma hat. So we lift uh, the curve to, to an element of the fundamental group. We compute uh, the homomorphism rho hat on that element. We obtain a matrix. We take its trace. Uh, now um, it's easy to check that uh, this is uh, well defined. So it's independent of choices. That's, of course, because when you leave the curve to an element of pi, it's up to conjugation. And uh, when you lift rho to uh, a homomorphism rho hat, it's also up to conjugation. Conjugation under the trace doesn't influence. So, um, so this, is, this is independent of choices, right? Um, so, um, that's very good. That's very good. So now one more remark before I state uh, the result of, uh, again, combination of a result of Goldman and uh, of some other observations. Um, so recall that last time we were looking at G of Sigma together with the Goldman bracket. Right, so this is um, this is defined uh, on curves. Um, right, so this is a Lie algebra. Then a simple observation, which again, well, miraculously was already mentioned by uh, Nikolai. So um, if you take the symmetric algebra. of uh, that Lie algebra, or in fact, of any other Lie algebra, is natural, it is naturally a Poisson 
it is naturally Poisson algebra. So um, you do it as follows. So on elements of degree one, that is on elements of G of sigma, you simply postulate that this is equal to the Goldman bracket. Now, if you decide to compute a bracket on the formal product, you simply use the definition uh, of a Poisson bracket, right? So this will be something like this, gamma one, gamma three times gamma two plus gamma one, gamma two, gamma three. All right, so, um, uh, so we have, um, we have a um, Goldman bracket, which gives rise to some huge, info, already the uh, Goldman Lie algebra is huge, infinite dimensional and everything. So now I built out of it some kind of monstrous object. In fact, um, remember Nikolai was telling us that we can draw several curves on the surface. So, uh, so this S G of Sigma, these are linear combinations of multi curves, right? Each element of G of Sigma, you can think that this is a linear combination of uh, homotopy classes of curves. Now you multiply several of them, you can simply draw them on the surface on top of each other. So you can, you can have some geometric picture for it if you wish. So, but still it's a relatively monstrous object. It's very, very large. Now uh, the moduli spaces that we were discussing, they are perhaps somewhat singular, but they are finite dimensional gadgets, G of and Ks. They are all finite dimensional. You take some powers, you divide by conjugation action. So now um, the following theorem um, so I will I will use the first part of the theorem, maybe not very cleanly, as a definition. So we define the maps phi n for each capital n, a uh, positive integer from this huge gadget and into functions on the moduli space of uh, G, GLN. Um, I think there should be one more bracket. Um, note that I'm saying vaguely functions, that's a little bit of a consequence of the fact that I never discussed properly what is this moduli space. So of course, with the moduli space, depending on which category I look at it, would come some natural space of functions, but since we haven't done it, so let's say functions. Um, and um, it works as follows. So um, on uh, curves, we are simply mapping them to Goldman functions f gamma, and then uh, we want it to be a, uh, a morphism of commutative algebra. So if we have multi curves, we map them into products. So gamma one, gamma two will be mapped to f gamma one, f gamma two, and so on. So. Um, uh, so the first statement is phi n are well defined. Um, so this is relatively clear why, because you take homotopy classes of curves and uh, then you're taking your representation of pi one, or you're taking your flat connection and you're associating to it the trace of the holonomy. So the trace of the holonomy doesn't change in the same homotopy class. So that's a property of flat connections or of representations of pi one. Um, so then the, the next, the next result, that's uh, one of the, big results of Goldman. And actually, 
that's a probably motivation for introducing the golden bracket in the first place, because the Atia bot bracket was known before. And then Goldman uh, figured out that actually uh, this bracket on homotopy classes of curves uh, is related to the Atia bot bracket on moduli spaces. So, um, right, what does it say? It says that phi n are Poisson maps. So, in other words, if you take um, the IT about bracket of two Goldman functions on the moduli space, you will get exactly the Goldman function of the Goldman bracket of the corresponding curves. So, um, of course, we haven't seen uh, the Atia board construction. So, for us, it's difficult to judge. Is it like easy or is it difficult or how it is? Um, however, let me state the following properties uh, of, uh, of the maps phi, I believe, due to Ettingoff, but here I may be mistaken. So, um, first of all, for each n, phi n is surjective. Surjective, it depends a little bit on how we negotiated the definition of functions. Uh, possibly with other definitions, the image will be dense. De depending on whatever, whatever what, what kind of functions we admit, what kind of topology we admit. But uh, all in all, it says the following. Uh, with those maps phi n, you get, roughly speaking, all the functions that you, you may want on the moduli space. So this in particular means that the formula above gives a complete description of the tier board bracket. If you didn't know what the tier board bracket was uh, for GLN moduli spaces, and actually we didn't know what it was, at least in this mini course, then the golden bracket tells you what it is. So now, now we know. You can also like turn it around and say that actually it gives a definition of the geometric structure on the moduli space. So this this Poisson structure. And yet another statement: uh, the uh, intersection over n of kernels of phi n is actually equal to zero. So um, in other words, um, of course, right, as we discussed, this S G of sigma is uh, huge. It's enormous. It's much bigger than, than any space of, any reasonable space of functions on the modular space. So presumably each phi n has a huge, enormous kernel. And the, I think this is simply true. So that's that's easier easy to give examples of elements in the kernel. Uh, but it turns out that if you take an intersection over all n, so if you consider matrices of any size, so then there will be no intersection. So you will catch all the elements of this enormous space as g of sigma. Uh, and uh, this basically, one can say that you can interpret it as uh, this Goldman bracket story and SG of sigma is a universal language to speak about all the moduli spaces for GLN or actually probably for UN, you can adapt it uh, all at once. So here we are, we are kind of speaking about universal facts uh, about the Poisson structure of the moduli space. So, um, right. Now, uh, um, after this somewhat generic description, I would like to do the following. Uh, I would like to recall you some much simpler uh, Poisson structure and then make a link between that much simpler Poisson structure and the Poisson structure uh, on the moduli space in genus zero. So this uh, part, it will be maybe slightly 
slightly more concrete, slightly more technical, and also it will allow us uh, in the beginning of tomorrow lecture to really switch the viewpoint. So perhaps today it won't be completely clear where we're heading, but in terms of the picture of the world uh, from, uh, from this first page of the mini course, this will give us a key to other topics related to both uh, planar curves and moduli spaces. Okay, so, um, so let me recall the um, KKS, Kirill of Cost and Suryo, Poisson bracket. And now I choose my Lie algebra to be uh, simply n by n complex matrices. Now, um, we already saw the non-degenerate scalar product, right? So this was T minus one of X, Y equal to the trace of X, Y. And this scalar product makes G isomorphic to its dual, G star. Uh, duals of Lie algebra are Poisson spaces. Um, probably most of you know that. But in any event, let me recall. So let me take an element. So an element is just uh, an n by n matrix. So Eij, they are elementary matrices with ones at the intersection of i's row and j's column. And Xij, these are simply numbers, matrix elements which stand there. So the KKS Poisson bracket in this particular case takes the following form, right? So this is delta JK XIL uh, minus delta IL XJK. So this is a linear Poisson bracket. Uh, and I would like to um, describe it, mm, describe it in a little bit different formalism. Um, I would like to remind you that virtually we are in St. Petersburg, right? That's, that's where we are supposed to be. We measure time. Uh, oh, is the kernel of intersection still equals to zero if you restrict only to primes? To be honest, I, I don't know. I would, I would need to think about it. Yeah, sorry. Mm, I'm not sure. Yeah, I, of course, you see, it's not, complete. let's say I doubt the special row of primes. It's not, but it's, but I think, yeah, I think yes, because I think if you take any sequence which goes to infinity, I think that that would be fine. The sequence of primes goes to infinity. I think yes. Yeah, I think yeah, the, the answer is yes for any subsequence of uh, integers which goes, goes to infinity. Um, sorry. So, um, right. I was saying that we are in St. Petersburg. And here is this so-called SPB notation. So um, you see, we need to uh, to write, uh, we need to operate with uh, Poisson brackets uh, of matrices, and it is convenient to use those uh, indices one and two to denote matrices in the tensor product where one of the components is one. So X tensor identity matrix is called X1, X2 is one tensor, tensor the identity matrix tensor X. So in fact, then uh, the KKS Poisson brackets can be written in the following form. You see here I'm uh, writing um, the Poisson bracket of matrix elements and the product of those matrices, right? And the right-hand side should be huge matrix. And uh, let me write it in the following form. So this is X1 minus X2. And the commutator with the permutation permutation matrix. So both the left-hand side and the right-hand side are n square by n square matrices. 
So uh, I leave it to you as an exercise to check. I hope I didn't make a mistake, but sign mistakes uh, and fact mistakes are always possible. Okay, so that's that's the first reminder. Now um, the next uh, the next thing, the next construction. I consider sigma, and now um, remember um, there was a discussion with Nikolai about singularities of connections. So I'm now taking a surface with punctures. It's somewhat more convenient than the surface, compact surface with boundary components. So my surface will be simply a complex plane and I delete n points from that complex plane. And um, I am considering elements x1, xn, in the direct product of n copies of G, and each copy of G is endowed with a KKS structure. So the KK, the, we, we take the direct product of KKS structures. Right, okay, so I have this uh, Poisson space, I have my surface, and now uh, I consider connections of the following form. Well, I think there should be this one over two pi i factor. And so I consider connections with simple poles on that surface. Right. Uh, note that um, this connection is flat. Is it obvious for everyone that this gadget is flat? Just, uh, just to tell you, right? Since I'm only using dz and uh, all the functions inside are holomorphic, then this means dA is zero. And then again, since I'm only using dz, uh, then when I take uh, a Lie bracket of A with A, it will be proportional to dz squared, and this will be again, zero because of the exterior algebra. So in fact, in the flatness condition, like everything is zero. So this is a flat connection. And this means that this formula, let me, so this simple formula, um, it defines the map. which depends on the points Z1, Zn. And this map, mm, again, my color code. Hmm. So Psi, Z1, Zn. And it maps G to the power N uh, to the moduli of GL and C flat connections, right? So I associate to that flat connection, its class in the moduli space. Uh, moreover, notice that um, I can divide uh, this Lie algebra to the power N by the conjugation or by the adjoint action of G and uh, this still goes through. So in fact, uh, this map turns out to be locally a diffeomorphism. It may have some bad points, some single points, but uh, if you if you are uh, in a small neighborhood of a good point, locally it will be a, a diffeomorphism. Um, and um, I should say that. Um, a similar picture and a theorem for uh, compact Lie algebras, uh, similar to the theorem that I plan, uh, I, will, I will stay on the next page, um, has been developed with very different techniques by Lisa Jeffrey quite some time ago. Um, so, but, but I will restrict myself to, to this context. And um, in this context, 
there is a very beautiful and i don't know how what about for you but for me somewhat unexpected theorem uh, it was also developed in many places. I learned it from uh, one article of Hitchin. Uh, and it says the following. Um, so for any set of points, Z1, Zn, this map is a Poisson map. Uh, for me, why, uh, why is it surprising? Why is it interesting? Um, that's because, um, because of the following reason, right? Um, so Psi is a very complicated map. So it's, um, it's some kind of uh, a complicated generalization of the exponential map. You take A given by the formula, in the bright red rectangle, and then you compute some holonomies of A around some curves, uh, and these are your Goldman functions. So it defines for you in some way the map to the moduli space, and the Poisson bracket uh, on uh, on those residues on matrices X i. This is a very naive uh, linear Poisson bracket, the KKS bracket. And the claim is that uh, the resulting bracket on Goldman functions, for instance, or on the moduli space, this will be this mysterious Atiyah bot bracket or the Goldman bracket, for instance, for Goldman functions. Um, I think it's surprising. We'll now look at some kind of outline in, in, the, in, in the remaining part of this lecture. We'll look a little bit at the, uh, at the outline of a proof. So I promise to try to prove something in every lecture, at least the first three. So that's that's the theorem that we're going to prove today. And actually, tomorrow we're going to look at it from a much more conceptual, less hands-on viewpoint. Try try to see to try to start seeing a big picture in it. Uh, maybe before speaking about the proof, a remark. Uh, so it's enough. to prove it for Goldman functions. We said that Goldman functions, they, these are more or less all the functions on the moduli space. So it's, it's enough to do it for Goldman functions. And then maybe another remark. So this whole story, right? Of course, there is this capital N in the story, but the results, they look like Uh, more or less independent of capital N. Uh, oh, Lisa, thanks a lot. So Lisa is saying that the result that I was citing of hers is a joint work with Jonathan. I apologize to Jonathan. I will correct myself in the future. Um, right, so, so it's independent of N. And, and that will be one, one important consideration for the next lecture. All right, now we try to do, we try to prove this Hitchens theorem. Um, so ideas of proof. Uh, so I'll start with several very standard facts, but they will in the end combine in the proof. Um, so suppose we have a parametric family uh, of connections on the segment. So this P is a parameter. So then uh, we are interested in the derivative with respect to this parameter. Of the holonomy 
of A uh, on this segment. So the holonomy of A will be always thinking that this is GLN, just uh, everything is matrices. So then there is the following formula. Maybe you can tell me how expected or unexpected it is for you. Now let me, my notation maybe not ideal. So, uh, so that's the, um, so that's the formula for a derivative, uh, right? So your connection depends on the parameter. And uh, so it turns out that this will be an integral where you first take a holonomy from zero to some point S in the interval. There you put in the one form, which is your connection one form, the derivative with respect to the parameter, and then you continue from S to one. You have to integrate that thing and that's the uh, derivative of the holonomy. So how is it, uh, I, I guess for you people, right? That's, uh, that, that's not, not a surprise, but uh, if it is a surprise, then later on, ask me. Uh, so then um, another similar fact, uh, I take gamma zero one to sigma. Now my segment is mapped to a surface. And A is a connection on the surface, which is flat. Uh, so gamma of zero is Z, gamma of one is W. And I would like to view this holonomy of gamma A as a function of Z and W, right? Locally, I can change the origin, uh, the, the source point and the target point. I can move them and I can slightly readjust the curve. And if, uh, if A is flat, this is a well-defined function of Z and W on some neighborhoods of the source and the target. So this is my curve and uh, it's a function on those two, on those two neighborhoods, right? So then the question is, what is the differential with respect to Z and W of all ZW gamma A? And again, uh, there's no surprise. This will be a w whole z w minus whole z w a z. Right. So sorry for torturing you with all this standard stuff. So there will be one more, one more very standard identity, which we're gonna need. So this is called the Arnold identity. And this is simply the following observation about rational functions. I will suggestively write it with a somewhat funny notation. So I will have three complex numbers, ZW and ZI, and then, uh, it is obvious that this is equal to the difference of those fractions times one over Z minus W. So this is one way to turn the Arnold identity. Okay. Now one more observation and then the calculation of the proof. So, I'm taking A1 of Z, A2 of W, using the SPB notation. And recall A's, they are one forms. So it's a little bit weird what I'm doing. I'm taking um, 
uh, I'm taking a wedge product of two one forms. And uh, I'm taking, so they are actually matrices, those one forms. I'm taking a tensor product of matrices and the Poisson bracket of coefficients, right? So this is, um, this is a somewhat, uh, somewhat weird thing, right? So um, somewhere here, there is a tensor product of matrices. Uh, there is a Poisson bracket of values and the wedge product of forms, right? So, so the claim is as follows. So putting together all the observations we had before, it turns out that uh, this is, uh, this will be uh, one half and here will be a one of Z commutator with the permutation plus a two of W commutator with permutation. And here D log Z minus W over two pi I. So I, uh, for the first time I saw this expression or equivalent one, in the four Crossley paper about Poisson structures on modular flat connections. But now with all the ingredients that I gave you, um, this is simply an exercise, right? So basically you need to combine the description of the Poisson bracket of axis, the formula for A, which is expresses which is expressed in terms of axis, and uh, you should use the the R naught identity. So that's uh, that's basically all what you need in order to see uh, to see this formula. Okay. So now uh, the final step in the proof and the final final calculation for today. Uh, so it's kind of magic. We, uh, what we do, we are very bravely computing a, a Poisson bracket of two Goldman functions, hoping for the best. So this is the KKS bracket, meaning that this is a bracket for those axes, right? So A is, uh, A is a function of axis, holonomy of A and the trace of holonomy of A are extraordinarily complicated functions of axis. But as functions of axis, they have Poisson bracket and this Poisson bracket is surely equal to something. Now we're gonna see uh, that it is exactly the Goldman bracket that we expect. I would say if I were you at this point, I still frankly wouldn't believe it, right? It doesn't look very plausible. So now recall, um, uh, recall, this, um, recall this formula for the derivative on the parameter. Why did I want that formula? Because axes are kind of parameters, right? And uh, the Poisson bracket is a, uh, uh, is a bivector. So we differentiate each of those two holonomies. So this is just to explain to you why it's plausible that we are getting the, form, the following formula. We differentiate each of them. This means that there will be an integral over the first curve and over the second curve. Here there will be a, here there will be a trace of one tensor two, so the product of uh, the tensor product of both traces. And here will be something like that, holonomy gamma one from some point S to the same point S. So I make a circle starting from some point S, tensor holonomy gamma two from some point T 
go around the circle to the same point T. And here will be A1, Z of S, A2, W of T, where Z of S and W of T are points on the curves gamma one and gamma two. Now recall that uh, there is some kind of, maybe not very easy, but some kind of uh, interesting expression for this Poisson bracket of A1 and A2. And also recall that there is this classical formula. So now let me, let me write the next line and you're gonna tell me whether you believe it. So this is equal to an integral gamma one times gamma two. Here will be D of trace. Now just the ordinary trace whole gamma one S1 to S times whole gamma two T to T. And here D log Z minus W by two pi i and possibly here i never know right with those maybe one half that's probably this one half now how comes this might be true well you know when you uh when you take d of each holonomy right now it starts and ends at the same point then uh this formula tells you right there will be a of Z and A of W appearing on different sides, right? And then here in the formula, you have those, uh, those permutations and those permutations conspire such that they make out of two traces one, because roughly speaking, what's going on, right? Let's try to make a drawing. So let me draw one trace like this, and another trace like that. So there are some factors on, on those lines. And then the permutation does this. But now a simple topological fact is that instead of uh, two circles, I just have one circle, right? So that's why I only have one trace here. And those Ds, they produce exactly those A of Zs and A of Ws the four of them exactly in the, in the way that uh, one needs to have them. So um, that's a kind of miracle. I don't have a very good explanation for it, but it, it simply works. Now, finally, we need to compute that integral. We still have two minutes. So that's an integral of a, of a torus. Uh, let me try to make a drawing. So this is, let's say, uh, S going from zero to one. And this is T going from zero to one. And um, note that under the integral, we have almost a total differential. Uh, not quite, because um, this term D log Z minus W, it might be singular. Where would it have singularities? So uh, Z of S equal to uh, W of T. These are exactly intersections of gamma one and gamma two, right? So imagine that somewhere here we have a point, right? Then if you eventually want to use the Stokes formula, uh, we should, take out some infinitesimal disk and the boundary of this disk would be a circle uh, labeled by the intersection point. So the final, the final calculation. So uh, now we are getting a sum over intersections of gamma one and gamma two. And uh, here we are, we are getting the trace of the holonomy. But if, uh, if we're sitting at Z of S equal to W of T, then this product of holonomies, that's exactly the holonomy 
of uh, gamma one has p gamma two a, right? Otherwise, this uh, trace of the product of holonomies on the integral does not make much of geometric sense because the point z of s and point w of t may be very different points on the curve. So it's very strange, this expression. But exactly at those points, all of a sudden it makes sense. And uh, this is multiplied by the integral over S1P of D log Z minus W divided by two pi I, which already looks like some kind of Cauchy formula. And it turns out that this integral uh, depends on the uh, mutual orientation on what we had before and is exactly equal to plus or minus one, which coincides with the sign epsilon P. Well, uh, that's the end of the proof and the end of today's lecture. Uh, I invite you to admire this, uh, this very strange fact. It's very beautiful. I mean, it's very unexpected. It's very strange. And as I, as I promised uh, tomorrow, so at the next lecture, we'll completely change the viewpoint. We, we, we try to turn it around. So today we were doing very concrete calculations so Poisson geometry moduli spaces so next time it will be more like algebra going back to topology possibly drift with associated so a completely different world but this will be our starting point well thanks a lot oh so thank you very much anton and uh, let's see whether any questions yeah there is a question about the finite dimensionality of the drum moduli space. Yeah, I think uh, sure this, uh, like if you're sufficiently careful when you're doing your analysis, uh, you will be able to show that it's finite dimensional. And uh, so you will be able to uh, identify the tangent space with some, uh, um, with some cohomology group of the surface twisted by the, uh, by the local system defined by uh, by your flat connection, so so that uh, and this uh, cohomology will be uh, manifestly finite dimensional. Yeah, I think sure you. I think all kinds of approaches have been developed over the years, so you can you can do everything infinite dimensionally as well if you want. Great, are there more questions? If I can ask a question. Oh, wow, sure. Uh, yeah. That sounds scary, right? I think okay. probably I'll the, ask it one, in, in one, person, one, but. Wow, one, one of the specialists. Okay, yeah, go ahead. No, no, I mean that uh, uh, your wonderful calculation that you did at the end. You know, mm -hmm. So it was somehow not not very secretly using bits of uh, pinching some of uh, connection and uh, say configuration space uh, mm -hmm. just your your points were mostly not moving just one of them yes uh, but still you, you were using all this uh, arnold's ident identity and things so what is the statement which is actually like true for this full kz connection and full uh configuration space that gives this thing or if this question ma makes sense yeah, yeah 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 let me yeah yeah let me let me try to uh let me try to recall so yes, of course you you can you can say that we can uh, um, we can allow those points to move. So then uh, uh, then we have uh, uh, then we have uh, um, we have a family of those maps. Then, for instance, one can ask uh, uh, the uh, probably many people here are actually specialists in the ISO monodromy problem, right? Well, you, you can ask uh, whether you can define ISO monodromy equations on the residues such that you would uh, preserve uh, the point of the moduli space. Uh, so these are Schlesinger equations and they would uh, define for you some kind of, uh, some kind of, uh, uh, flat connection, right? So you can you can uh, uh, you can think that. How is it? Uh, I think the relation to the uh, to the more full uh, Knizhnik zemological equation 
will, will be like that, right? In the Knishnik Zamolochik of equation, uh, you are allowed to move not only one point, but all the points. And uh, here, what, what we're doing, we are looking at some kind of uh, um, special, so, so we, we're looking at the projection to, to that configuration, but now we, we can start moving configurations and uh, there would be some kind of local system now, as far as I recall, on the moduli spaces. I don't, may, maybe I should like better prepare for the next time, but uh, that would basically be here. I think it will be the uh, more like the Schlesinger equation, which would uh, semi-classically reconstruct for you the KZ system. Was it the right answer, Pavel? Oh, <laughs> it's not an exam, so I don't know. Well, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but, but thanks a lot, anyways. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for asking. So there is uh, there is a question. Uh, whether the uh, uh, moduli space is uh, independent uh, of the surface. Uh, yeah, in some way, uh, let's say, this depends of what kind of structures you want to keep on that moduli space. But uh, if you start moving the points, there is a possibility to transform one moduli space to the other. So from that perspective, uh, Yes, uh, the moduli space is in some way independent of where you place the points. And from that perspective, it's independent of the complex structure of the surface. But if you, if you want to fix, to, to keep track of more structures on the moduli space, if you, for instance, want to induce the uh, complex structure from the complex structure of the surface, then of course it will remember of where you placed your point Z. But um, Poisson ge geometrically or symplectically, uh, that doesn't matter. They will be always morphic. Okay, look, thanks a lot for your questions. But thank you very much. Anton. May, may I have one question, Anton? Oh, sure. Yes, of course. Uh, well, ju just comment. So, uh, no, can you just say how uh, this approach is related to uh, original Goldman's uh, derivation from Chen Simons? Uh, you mean which approach? The, uh, that's you. Yeah, that you presented on this last slide. Oh, the. Oh, but I think uh, I, well, you see, um, maybe I, I should have refreshed Goldman papers, but I, I don't think Goldman uh, was looking at this particular, right? We're, we're now, we're now deciding. No, it was different. It was from Chern Simon. So just locality came from there. Oh, you mean, you mean uh, how it is related to the, uh, 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 to the to the to the first theorem that I cited that Atiyah bought yes, is equal yes. to Goldman. Um, now, when you see here, it's it's it's. I think the, why I'm a bit hesitant. Like uh, perhaps I would refer the. Yeah, I think the answer to your question uh, is more like if you if you were trying to define the infinite dimensional Poisson bracket, right? Using the Atiyah board two form. Then if it existed reasonably, it would have been local, right? Because there you have DA wedge DA, the integral. So the Poisson bracket should be D over DA wedge D over DA integral at one point, right? Let me, let me maybe, maybe write it. So the answer would have been something like that, right? So the uh, atier bot by vector would have been something like that, right? Uh, I, I don't know, or maybe I should be, uh, I should be writing those uh, functional derivatives, right? Right, or, right, yeah, no, no, that's, that's So, right. so, and uh, this is an integral of a surface and this is uh, completely local. So then uh, if uh, symplectic reduction for, works fine in infinite dimensions, then it doesn't matter whether you compute the Poisson bracket before the reduction or after the reduction, right? So then uh, what we are saying, suppose I have my two curves, right? They intersect at some point P and uh, the Poisson by vector of a T and what simply doesn't see 
the points which are not the same, right? So then we would have said that the only contribution comes from here. Of course, it has some kind of delta function in the integral. So it's, uh, it's, it's highly singular, but uh, the integral over two surface against the delta function gives us exactly the contribution that uh, we are talking about. And in principle, I think you can probably even that you you can you can also in some way make it work. I I guess um, right. But Goldman surely haven't done that. He he was he was working all the, always with a finite dimensional construction, and he gave an independent construction of the symplectic structure, and he proved that this this was a symplectic structure. At least as far as I recall. So from that perspective, this is not the Goldman's calculation. The Goldman's calculation is all in terms of finite dimensional picture. As far as far as I, I, I mean, uh, here I, I have to refresh. Okay, so I, I, I will yeah, have a, look I'm a little bit at this paper, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. But but here I'm a little bit hesitant, but I'm I'm almost sure. It is like that. So if you are asking about the relation to infinite dimensional atier board construction, that's roughly the outline, but that's not the Goldman proof. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, probably uh, the there last is, there is just, just the last comment. Uh, I think Lisa is right. Goldman. Didn't didn't use Chern Simons. He was um, he he was his paper on symplectic nature of uh, uh, of fundamental groups of surfaces. It does not refer to Chern Simons. And as far as I recall, maybe I'm mistaken again. It doesn't refer to any physics at all. I I may be I may be wrong. Yeah. No. So this is um, uh, this is a pure mass construction. Just thinking about representations of the fundamental group and um, of the tangent space to the modular space. So, so if I may add something, so I think Leonis questions basically boils down to the question about relationship between a tier bot bracket for flat between AZ and Z bar, right? And, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Kirill of course that bracket. And no. uh, formally, but probably not extremely rigorously, you can understand one as the Dirac, uh, you can obtain one of them by direct procedure of the earth, right? It's, but just fixing the, the constraint AZ bar equals zero using the curve vanishing of curve, which is one constraint, AZ bar is another constraint. You get to the second class the constraints, and then you compute the direct bracket formally, mm -hmm. uh, trying to close your eyes on various mathematical <laughs> imperfections which you get on the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I may, maybe I should uh, just uh, as a last comment, I should say that I did close my eyes on various complications on the construction of the moduli space, but I hope I, uh, in the Poisson calculations, I didn't close my eyes too much. So this, uh, this is more or less, more or less a correct calculation that I showed you. Mm -hmm. 